All right, thank you all very much for coming. And as Nancy just mentioned, my name is Mike Peeler and I am the head of the program in estuarine ecology and human health here at Coastal Studies Institute. And one of the things that I do a lot of work on is nitrogen cycling. And many of you may know that nitrogen is an important uh, element for just about all living things and is a critical limiting nutrient for many plants, particularly in coastal areas. So algae that live in the water in coastal areas are limited by nitrogen. So it's an issue when you have too much because then you get too much algae and you get a condition known as eutrophication. So a lot of the work that we do is looking at natural systems and trying to figure out how they work and trying to understand when they have problems, what the causes might be, and then what some solutions may be to get rid of problems once we understand the cause. And it turns out, though I've not had the opportunity to study many particularly charismatic things, recently we've been working a lot on oysters, which has been an interesting thing and an interesting departure because they are, as the title suggests, delicious. And so most of the things that we've worked on the past have not been things that people would like to eat. A salt marsh, for example, you don't have a lot of competition from people trying to eat the salt marsh. Oysters, on the other hand, there are certainly competing interests for the oysters. So I'd like to acknowledge my two institutions, as Nancy did already, Coastal Studies Institute and the University of North Carolina Institute of Marine Sciences, which is in Moorhead City. Is no, thank you. I'm good. I thought I was on. Forgive me. All right, there we go. So I start out with a quote from Ernest Hemingway that I found putting this talk together that I absolutely love. And I hate to read things to you, but I'm going to. As I ate the oysters with their strong taste of the sea, their faint metallic taste that the cold wine washed away, leaving only the sea taste and the succulent texture, and as I drank their cold liquid from each shell and washed it down with the crisp taste of the wine, I lost the empty feeling and began to be happy and to make plans. I think anyone who has a fondness for oysters, this really captures it. And for a lot of people, it's not a simple thing to eat. It's a ritual and it's part of something that makes a lot of people happy. And I think that that is an important thing to remember is that these oysters, from my perspective, pull everything out of the water, put it in the sediments, and change the way that nutrients cycle. But they're really much more. And hopefully I'll capture some of that in this talk. So another quote from Jonathan Swift, he was a bold man that first ate an oyster, definitely true in my book. I find some of them delicious, however this one looks like it might have been a bold choice. Early on people began to fish oysters and they did it pretty well pretty quickly. These are pictures from the 1700s with tongs and then bringing in the, the uh, sailing vessels and dragging dredges behind. And as people wanted more oysters, they got better at getting them and like so many things, Getting better at getting them can have consequences. This is a picture from the Chesapeake Bay where the oyster fishery peaked in 1890. And this, I think, is a little pixelated, perhaps, but that's a huge stack of oyster shell. So we were very, very effective at getting oysters out of the water. Um, previously, before humans started eating oysters, they were literally underwater mountains. And so in this rough schematic, you see the water surface and you see an oyster reef, many of which on early maps were, were referenced as hazards to navigation. It was a big problem. People crashed into giant oyster reefs all the time. But as we came in and began to fish them, first using hand tongs, knocked them down a little bit. Then as we get dredges and more mechanization, what were the mountains? became little hills and eventually very flat reefs. And this is a figure looking more formally at the introduction of the different technologies, starting with the hand tongs and moving all the way through to having dredge vessels. And what you see doesn't look like a natural resource curve where you have some demand on it and then you decrease that demand and it bounces back. This is, looks more like a mining curve where you're taking a resource and you're pushing it to the point of depletion. And obviously, that's not going to work for the people who want the oysters in the water to do the things they do for the environment, and it's not going to work for the people who want the oysters in the water to eat. So the challenge becomes, how can we do all of these things at once? This is a map showing the peak of the fisheries in each of the areas along the Gulf and Atlantic coast. And so you can see that the demand comes from the northeast, they were fished down first and then gradually worked their way around the coast just about in order in distance away from New York City and fished down the oysters. 
and these figures on the right hand side are showing the total landings in terms uh, in millions of kilograms through time in uh, in the different states so on the bottom axis you have from north to south the states listed and as you go down through the figures you're going through time so the main thing you can see is that there was a big peak in production at one point in the 50s uh, I'm sorry in 1850 and then followed by a decrease in 1900 and much still as you move down forward to 2000 where there's just not an awful lot of wild oyster production throughout the world um, this is looking at a map of this is a, from a paper by Beck et al which is a great paper if anybody's interested in it looking at oyster uh, about uh, entitled oyster reefs at risk and looking at the problem of complete loss of oyster reefs in many places um, the cooler colors the blue and the blue is good yellow is fair and then these warmer colors red and this uh, rust color are either poor or functionally extinct what you see is that there are significant areas in North America and other areas in Europe where there simply are not oysters anymore in the wild and there are very few areas that remain good so as a resource and as a habitat oyster reefs have been lost um, up to 99 percent of them are gone from some bays and 85 percent of oyster reefs are estimated to have been lost globally And this is looking at um, eco-regions eco and all of the eco-regions covered here throughout the world. And what you have on the bottom axis are the annual catch of oysters. And what's striking is that the wild catch of oysters um, between 1995 and 2004 was confined to a very narrow area of the world. So the Carolinian, Floridian, Virginian, Gulf of Mexico South and Gulf of Mexico North are all in that first map that I showed you of the Atlantic coast and the Gulf Coast and that's in the entire world so this is just to emphasize that this is not a local or a regional issue it's certainly a global issue and that in some ways the area where we are has it better than much of the rest of the world in terms of the wild population remaining so there's been a lot of recent work um, because of efforts to restore oysters trying to understand not just in terms of area but in terms of the quality of the reefs what have we lost and so there have been big groups who've gotten together and done a really good job of finding historical data some of which is strikingly good and sometimes better than the information that we have for present present day coverage of oyster reefs and so this large group um, published a paper recently that they called historical ecology with real numbers looking at past um, coverage and past uh, biomass of oysters in lots of different uh, bays throughout the world and what they wanted to do was to look at both the spatial extent and the biomass because the spatial extent can be misleading if it's very poor quality it's not a very valuable resource either as a fishery or from an ecological perspective so they used these two metrics and they went into the literature and found where they had historical data and where they had present day data and were able to make comparisons in individual bays and interestingly a lot of the time they were limited by present day data rather than being limited by historical data so this is changes in aerial extent again the uh, the warm colors tend to be the uh, the low numbers of percent historic remaining with red being less than one percent remaining and orange being one to ten yellow ten to uh, fifty and then as you warm up you have more remaining so this is for the United States and what you see is that large areas have very little oyster reef remaining relative to their their historic reference sites and really only the Gulf region has significant percentages remaining relative to historic numbers and that's the the area that comes up as good so that's aerial extent so that's how much oyster reef is there out there in area and as I just said that can be a little misleading if the quality isn't good so they also looked at um, changes in biomass so once again the warm colors are the lower percent remaining and the cooler colors are the higher percent remaining and even more so than the loss of area there has been a loss of adult biomass and so this speaks to the condition of the reefs so we have a lot, few, a lot less area a lot fewer reefs and many of them have much less biomass 
and you can see that from either perspective, as someone who's looking to eat the delicious oyster or someone who's looking for the oyster to do the things that they do in the environment, these are not good signs. So in summary, there's been about a 65% uh, decrease in spatial extent throughout the world, and then an 88% decrease in biomass. And as I just alluded to, the difference in these two, the greater decrease in biomass, um, highlights that there's been a really big decline in habitat quality. And that, of course, is, is even more problematic, is, is compounds the problem of the loss of area. So we have lots, of less, lots less area, but the area that we have remaining is of, of lower quality. So this is uh, from Alice Through the Looking Glass, Lewis Carroll, and people may recall Tweedledee and Tweedledum talking to Alice and telling her the story of the walrus and the carpenter. And the walrus and the carpenter famously tricked the oysters into coming to dinner and told them all the great stuff they were going to do, and then they ate them. So oysters, certainly in, in the context of people, have had a little bit of a, of a tough ride. But uh, in, recently, there's been more interest in oysters being left in the water rather than oysters necessarily being invited to dinner. So when you do degrade um, oyster reefs and you lose um, any type of habitat, whether it be an oyster reef, a salt marsh, or a seagrass bed, habitat degradation lose, leads to decrease in their function, and then a loss of something that people now refer to as ecosystem services. And ecosystem services are things that natural systems do that are of value to people. And I think this is, in some, for some people, this can be a little bit of a troubling concept. Either they think it's a natural system, we shouldn't value it, it does what it does no matter what, or we don't want to put dollar values on natural systems. However, if you're going to be making a whole series of decisions about how you live that almost all are based on costs and benefits and values, it's a really important metric, I think, ecosystem services to put on par the things that these natural systems are doing so that you can make a decision and have a good sense of what the consequence might be as far as the function of the natural system. The other thing is if you lose these ecosystem services, you find out very quickly and you more often than not have to spend money to do what they were doing in another way. So when you degrade habitats, you almost always lose complexity. You simplify. So if you go from the tropical rainforest to the parking lot or to the agricultural field, those are much simpler habitats than are the more complex forest and tropical rainforest. And in the case of marine systems, when you simplify, you tend to go from a coral reef or a seagrass bed or an oyster reef or a salt marsh to a flat that looks something like that on the right. And if you're a fan of benthic algae or small worms, there are still things that people are interested in and there's still some function, but the simpler habitats tend to have degraded levels of function. And as you degrade, as you simplify these habitats, you have less complexity and a lower abundance of organisms associated with those communities. And so with a loss of diversity and a loss of number of organisms, again, your function tends to go down. And there tends to be a pretty strong link between diversity and ecosystem function. So complex habitats tend to be much more diverse than do simple habitats, as is evidenced here. And in the general scheme are a more desirable thing from all levels in terms of, of their function. Ooh, a little out of control. So this, let me make sure I haven't missed it. Okay, there we go. This is um, a table from a, a paper by John Grabowski, a colleague of mine um, who I collaborate on, with on a lot of stuff and actually gave me several of these slides, looking at the loss of habitat, so the simplification of habitat in some places where if we've lost marsh and we've lost seagrass and in this area lost oyster reef, we probably are ending up with a, a simpler habitat. So if you look um, throughout the United States, um, if you first will go over to the right-hand side for uh, percentage loss, you can see that a great deal of salt marsh has been lost, a great deal of seagrass has been lost. Uh, mangrove and coral reef are not pre obviously around here in temperate areas, but in, in tropical areas, a great deal of them have been lost too. And then finally, oyster reefs, as I already mentioned, 80 to 85 percent lost. Um, the good news is that there have been efforts to restore all of these. 
Um, the interesting news, and the news that is less true than it was when this table was put together, is that oyster reefs are lagging way behind in terms of their area restored. Um, and also, uh, the cost, the middle column, is very interesting because what you see is that oyster reefs, I think I'll demonstrate in a second, have a lot to offer and that, in fact, they are, in terms of restoration, probably a pretty good value in terms of the cost per acre to restore. So in the last four or five years, there have been a lot of oyster restoration efforts. And as, those, uh, as that area gets included in tables like these, I think it'll be clearer that oyster reefs are, are moving up in terms of area restored. But certainly, this table demonstrates there's a long way to go. 85% gone, you can restore for a very long time and not be anywhere near um, too many oyster reefs, if you will. So I talked a little bit about um, ecosystem services. And this is a table just detailing all the things that, oops, that oyster reefs do. Um, obviously, number one, ecosystem services are a broad enough definition that there are things called provisioning services. So number one is production of oysters. So that is considered an ecosystem service. The things that you can eat um, are, are an ecosystem service. And that benefit is defined by the market value. Um, they also have been demonstrated in a lot of research to augment fish production. And that can be evaluated by looking at the ma market value of, or the recreational value of that increased fish production. Water filtration, and on the way out, maybe we can all look at it. John McCord, our education coordinator, has put together a great tank of oysters um, in the lab down the way. And their ability to filter water is remarkable. And it's the thing that a lot of people know about. And when you see an oyster reef, if you ever see a video of an oyster reef, which may not be that common, they're, what they're doing is clearing up the water. And so they have this presumptive effect of increasing water quality. And they certainly do clarify water, but they also do a lot of other things when they filter, one of which is um, increase this process called denitrification. And I'll talk about that in detail. That's the, the stuff that we're doing, and I think um, has become a really interesting part of the oyster story. They also stabilize habitats. They provide habitat for invertebrates, which are food for other fish. Um, they do sequester carbon, not through shell formation, because shell formation actually generates CO2, but through burial of organic matter in the reefs. And then finally, they diversify the seascape. And so as I was talking about complex habitats having more different organisms and probably having um, an improved ecosystem function, as you add them back in and restore them, you're increasing complexity and you're actually perhaps increasing the quality of adjacent habitats and the, what's referred to as a seascape as a whole. So Chesapeake Bay is an example um, that a lot of people cite when they think about oysters and their filtration capacity. In the 1600s, it's been calculated that oysters filtered the entire bay once a week. Following their catastrophic loss that I documented in a couple of those figures, they require more than a year to filter the water. So that filtration capacity alone, getting things out of the water column and into the sediments and into a place that's probably pretty reactive, is a dramatic change for the function of that system. Another thing that oysters do is stabilize shorelines. Um, this is a graphic from a New York Times um, op-ed piece uh, recently following Hurricane Sandy. And this is a really, it's an interesting article. It's, I think, a little bit optimistic in that it suggests if we had all of our native oyster reefs, we wouldn't have had as much flooding from Sandy, which I think is a little bit on the hopeful side. But it is true that oyster reefs stabilize shorelines, and they do baffle some um, wave energy and do some things to slow down flooding. But I do think that, uh, like everything, we need to temper our enthusiasm and figure out the, the empirical relationship between the oyster shoreline stabilization and things like flooding and erosion. And a lot of great work is, is ongoing in that area. And then um, looking now at the fin fish, the thing that a lot of people are interested in, these are data from John Grabowski, my colleague who I mentioned, looking at oyster reefs in three different uh, landscape settings. So the black area here is a salt marsh. The white area has an oyster reef on a salt marsh, similarly on a mudflat and on a seagrass bed. Um, these data are from when the reef was first built in the first five years, and then the data on the right are, in the, are from year 14. And what you see is that you have more fin fish in areas with oyster reef than you do without. So whether it be a true augmentation, an increase in biomass, or whether it be an attraction, 
you end up with a lot more fin fish on oyster reefs than you do in areas without. And that's very important to, to both commercial and recreational interests, obviously. Um, I mentioned eutrophication at the beginning. So eutrophication is a condition in a natural system where it's grown too much. So in the case of an estuary like the one we're sitting on, if you have too much algae, if you have too, much, too many plants, you're producing carbon beyond the system's ability to assimilate it. And so that carbon then becomes a pollutant. And this paper is uh, called The Eutrophication Commandments. It's by a colleague of mine, Wally Fulweiler. And it's an interesting look at, it's a, a very accessible um, list of things that we probably need to do to try and combat eutrophication. And I think it's a, a neat paper. I was a little drawn to it because she referred to us pretty quickly in her first commandment, and I thought that was pretty neat. Um, but the first commandment is that thou shalt protect coastal ecosystems to deliver biodiversity and ecological services. So it, it is true and has been shown with multiple habitats that there is value in an oyster reef, in a salt marsh, and in having this diversity of habitats in helping maintain this balance of nutrients. All of these habitats are very bioreactive and tend to remove excess levels of nutrients. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. So this is a little overwhelming, but I'm gonna quick get into it. This is the nitrogen cycle. And so we have more than anything, let's just look at the aesthetic of the nitrogen cycle in this abstract form. It looks like a recycling symbol. It looks very, it's very symmetric. Um, it looks like something that can continue on in balance. And in fact, it can. The problem arises when the things that you have coming in here, this is ammonia and this is nitrate, when you have these terms, say these arrows are this width, imagine that 100 times the width, that circle is not going to hold up as well. And so all of the processes that occur in this circle that move nitrogen around and keep it in balance, keep the, the concentrations in pl certain places in balance, are strained. And so processes like this, denitrification, which removes these, this bioavailable form of nitrogen and converts it to N2 gas, which is in the air. A great deal of our, of our atmosphere is N2 gas. So this process becomes even more important as the cycle gets out of balance. So if we have big amounts of nitrogen coming in from agriculture or from urban development or from sewage treatment plants, wherever it may be, everybody contributes, you need to find new places to put it or else your concentrations are gonna go up and up and up and you're gonna have things like nuisance algal blooms and low oxygen and fish kills and all the things that people don't want. So, this is the, the cartoon that I offer of, of the modern coast in a lot of places, where you have everyone contributing more water and everyone contributing um, more nutrients, potentially. So if you have water flowing across a hard surface or through pipes and you have sources of nutrients, you're going to be increasing your nitrogen and also phosphorus and other element load um, to the estuary. And in turn, you can get too much algal growth, as I referred to. If you have more than these fish can eat, it tends to fall into the bottom where it degrades. It's broken down by bacteria who use up oxygen. And you have habitat degradation and all sorts of bad cascading problems. So if we can keep this process optimized, or if we can create conditions that favor that process, you can bring a lot of this back into balance. Now, like I was critical of the oysters, someone suggesting that the oyster reefs could stop the flooding caused by Sandy. I don't think that oyster reefs can, can make this cartoon completely happy, but they can do a lot to contribute to bringing the cycle back into balance. So these are the habitats that we have typically around here. We have subtidal flats, those that are always underwater, intertidal flats that are intermittently exposed. These are simple habitats, as I was talking about earlier. We have the complex habitats, seagrass, salt marsh, and oyster reefs. And we are interested in the nitrogen cycle, as I said. So this is the process of denitrification, the removal. And what we found when we did this work um, in the late 2000s, just prior to 2010, was interesting things that, some of which were known, that salt marshes had pretty high rates of denitrification and that seagrass beds had pretty high rates of denitrification. But what we found and that people hadn't shown before was that oyster reefs 
had the highest rates of denitrification of all. And so there have been suggestions and models that it made sense that oyster reefs would have high rates of denitrification, but these were the first published data that, that showed it directly, um, measuring it directly. And I won't get into the methodological details, but it's a hard thing to measure, and these were direct measurements. So we, what we wanted to then were take those data, take those bars for those individual figures and the individual seasons and move into the ecosystem. And in order to do that, we had to have these directly measured data. We wanted to know um, information from all the habitats. We wanted to be able to scale it to the natural systems, so have landscape configuration and habitat area. And then we also needed to know about water inundation. And so we were working in Bogue Sound in Moorhead City, and we were able to get a, a really good habitat map and we were able to get some inundation data and then use this map to scale the rates that we just saw up to the scale of the landscape. So using the rates that we measured, the areas that we had, and the inundation time, we could then find how much nitrogen is removed by habitat. And what was interesting here is that the one that seemed a little mundane, the subtitle flat, had a relatively low rate, was a huge proportion of the total removal because it's the most common habitat. But if you think back to the rates, what we see here is what we see is an opportunity that if we can increase the area of the oyster reefs, of the seagrass, and of the marsh, we have the potential to have even more nitrogen removed in this system, which is important because it's heavily developed and at this point it has quite good water quality, probably maintained a lot by, by these high levels of denitrification. So this is just breaking it down into a, a pie chart to just give you a, another visual of, of the distribution of nitrogen removal. So for Bogue Sound, what we found is that um, 28.3 million moles of nitrogen were removed per year. And that's a lot of nitrogen. And as I said about ecosystem services, it's an interesting thing to assign value to a natural system. But you can rest assured that if this nitrogen removal weren't there, if that much more nitrogen were in Bogue Sound, you would know, and we would have to find another way to remove it. So this is, uh, uh, I think, speaking to that exact issue a little bit more. Um, how much does estuarine nitrogen removal cost? We all know that coastal land is expensive, and so any management practice that needs land is going to be a pretty expensive approach. Um, so things like stormwater retrofits can cost as much as $200 per pound to remove nitrogen. Um, for stormwater for new development, a little less expensive because it's not a retrofit. Anything related to a wastewater treatment plan is relatively expensive. Um, this figure suggests that restored or constructed wetlands can be relatively inexpensive. I think that kind of depends. Having been involved in some of those projects, they, they sometimes are inexpensive and sometimes they're more expensive than you might think. But the main take home message here is that removing nitrogen, particularly in coastal regions, costs a lot of money. So that, that nitrogen that's being removed by these natural systems is really important. And this is just the title of this paper. It's another Chesapeake Bay document. So we have now these rigorous data, which we're happy about. We know the, the net contributions of these figures to nitrogen processing. That means we look at all of the things they do to nitrogen cycling, not just one thing. And then we hope to generate these data that'll be transferable to other systems. And so now we can look at this natural system. And as I said, some people don't like to do, but I've, I've grown to enjoy. We can look here and say, OK, from the nitrogen cycling perspective, what is this worth? Well, the oysters are worth about $1,600 per year in nitrogen removal. The salt marsh is $1,300. The subtidal flat is $200. The intertidal flat is, six, I'm sorry, seagrass bed is $1,600. And then the intertidal flat is $800. So when you think of it this way, decisions that you make that affect these habitats are a little bit easier to understand in the context of a lot of other decisions that are based on the bottom line. Can I that per acre Sorry, per hectare per year, yep. So if you total up the value of all the things that oyster reefs do, all the services that we talked about, um, they're worth about $10,122 per hectare per year. And the, this is a, a, a data set from a set of reefs that were built in Pamlico Sound a couple of years ago. So it's a, a specific set of reefs. 
And if you look at the individual services, the interesting thing to me, and to many others, I guess, is that nitrogen removal is a big part of that total value. So the information I just showed you about oyster reefs having higher rates of denitrification and about the amount of nitrogen that's removed by these habitats turns out to be a pretty significant part of the total picture in terms of the value that oyster reefs are providing as an ecosystem service. So some time ago, back in Jules Verne time, at, uh, when he was writing 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, he saw a connection between nitrogen and oysters. This is a little bit of a stretch because this is how much they would have to eat to have enough protein to survive. But at least a long time ago, people knew that oysters and nitrogen were, were a, a connection. And now we're trying to take this a little farther and, and see not only the connection between the nitrogen and the tissue, but the nitrogen that they're moving around in terms of the nitrogen cycle. So we look again at the estuarine landscape, and if you recall, um, the data I showed you about fin fish were for oyster reefs in different contexts. So an oyster reef on a mud flat, an oyster reef by a seagrass bed, and an oyster reef by a salt marsh. So if you think about it, if you're putting a habitat somewhere where there's nothing else around that has structure, like a mud flat, there's a reasonable chance you're gonna get more value, you're gonna get more return for, for that, uh, restoration effort. But no one knew anything about this in the context of nutrient cycling, so we wanted to see if we could uh, figure out whether we saw the same things that they saw as far as fish augmentation went. And so we actually were able to revisit the same reefs that I showed you data from. This is my graduate student, Ashley Smith, coring an oyster reef, which is a non-trivial task, as many of you know, I imagine. Um, we sampled again, this was during the summer of 2010, we were able to visit these experimental reefs that had been built more than a decade ago, which was a great, great um, opportunity for us. And so we were looking at what we called the control habitats, just the mudflat, just the marsh, just the seagrass bed, and then all of those with an oyster reef added in. And what we found was that anywhere that you added in an oyster reef, you got a higher rate of denitrification and you got a significantly higher rate of denitrification when you added an oyster reef to the mudflat. So it, it, it's what we expected. Adding an oyster reef to an area without a structured habitat brought you more of a return in terms of increased um, nitrogen removal. The other thing that was really interesting in this study is that we didn't only measure the process as it existed um, with ambient conditions, we increased the nutrient conditions. So we simulated something like a storm where you would have a pulse of nutrients and saw how the system responded. And that was really striking because anywhere that you had an oyster reef, you had a huge increase in denitrification. And this is favorable because if you have a big pulse of nitrate, you want to be able to de denitrify as much of it as, as you can. And you can see in the other systems without the oyster reef, there was no response to this storm pulse of nitrate. So this speaks to even more potential capacity to maintain water quality. So in sum, we found certainly that landscape position did um, influence the capacity of the, the sediments to denitrify in oyster reefs, and that it allowed them to be responsive to these pulses of nutrients. So if you're looking for a remedial solution to a nutrient problem, it looks like oyster reefs may be a good answer. So oyster reefs, or oysters, are what people call ecosystem engineers. They create or modify the environment through their actions. And they can, they can modify um, the environment through direct effects, um, like oyster filtration, or through indirect effects, just being structure sitting up in the water column. And this is broken down into the characteristics of being either an all allogenic engineer, that modify by processing materials, so that would be through the filtering, or an autogenic engineer that modifies the environment just by being structure. So an oyster shell has some effect, but an oyster itself has even more. And we were interested in what was it about the oyster reefs that were causing all these effects that we saw. Could we just put out some rocks and have the same effect, or did we in fact need oyster, oysters themselves filtering to increase um, and demonstrate the, the impacts that we have been seeing. So this is Ben von Korf and Nate Giraldi from the Institute of Marine Sciences setting up um, experimental plots with live and dead oysters 
in an experiment that Ashley Smith, whose picture I showed you a minute ago, conducted in my lab. And what she found, what Ashley found was really interesting that you saw increases in, so this is the control, this is the sediments alone, this is with just shell, um, and then the right hand bar is with live oysters. So you did see some increase in denitrification with just the structure, but with the live oysters where you saw the really significant increase. And so this might have been what we would have guessed, but it's really important to understand um, how the increased denitrification can be partitioned. So when you build an oyster reef, if you're restoring and you just put out shell, what can you expect in the near term? Probably something like the middle bar. And then as it is established and colonized by, by oysters and is actively filtering, you can expect something like the farther away, uh, the blue bar. And interesting, more interesting still, and not something that we're going to make a huge deal about because we're not entirely sure how much we believe it's generalizable, but after just a few weeks, the rate with the live oyster um, plots was very similar to that that we saw on the, the intact oyster reefs, the natural oyster reefs. And people who, restoration practitioners, are really interested in the trajectory of restoring services. So how quickly do you get the capacity to denitrify back? And with oysters here, it looks like it might be two weeks. And I'm not ever going to say that officially, but it looks like it's a lot quicker. A salt marsh, people think it might be 30 years. So it appears that the function of oyster reefs um, mimics the natural system or matches the natural system pretty quickly. All right, so the $64,000 question, can we have our cake and eat it too? So can we restore these oysters, um, maybe not to the level where they once were, um, but to a level that provides these really valuable and desirable ecosystem services? And can we maintain uh, a, a flow of oysters for people to enjoy and eat? And I, I hope that the answer is yes. And I'm not going to give a full answer today, but I can tell you that the, reef, the work that we've done on reefs recently, um, just the background information that I gave you early, I think demonstrated clearly that oyster reefs have been depleted significantly in area and condition that the things they do are really valuable to people. So they are valuable as a fishery, but the things that they do in the ecosystem are also very valuable. And hopefully, um, I made it relatively straightforward and not too boring, though I have to say, it's Robert in the back always makes fun of me for taking care, taking, uh, talking about nitrogen constantly and boring everyone to tears. So hopefully that wasn't the case. But uh, hopefully I put the nitrogen part in context and, and you can appreciate that the things that oysters do change the sediments and change, change the environment to increase the amount of nitrogen that's removed and that that's a good thing. Um, and we know that we can restore a lot of these lost services, but then how do we balance that with the, the demands for oysters for consumption? And I think I'm happy to be talking about this at one of our early seminars here because this question, this last question, is not a science question. It's a broad interdisciplinary question that brings in social science, it brings in natural science, it brings in all sorts of things about personal preference and culture and heritage. And that's what we're building the capacity to do here. And that's the kind of work that we all want to do here. I really enjoy all the stuff I presented, but it makes me happier still when we take that science and try to make sense of it in the confusing real world. So the last question is not one that I have data for and not one that anybody really knows the answer to, but I will say we're working on it. There is a big emphasis on coupled natural human systems um, at National F Science Foundation and other funding agencies to really consider how do you take science that no matter how right it is, still needs to be put in the context of, of the real world, and then how do you understand things like maintaining oyster populations to maintain ecosystems and to give people something delicious that they like to eat. So there were tons of invaluable contributions to this. John Grabowski in the upper left hand side, um, my great lab in those two pictures, and then particularly Ashley Smith who recently got her PhD in my lab. A great deal of this work is, is from her dissertation and all of these people have contributed significantly. And thank our funding agencies, thank you all for coming and acknowledge my co-authors on any of the papers that I mentioned of mine. And thank you very much. I would be happy to take questions. Robert.
Sure. We're, uh, we're going back to the earlier slides that Robert found compelling, and hopefully others maybe, um, looking at degradation of oyster reefs. And then we're, I, th I think we're going to maybe talk a little more broadly about um, not only, so what was the consequence of their loss, and then if we didn't have this, this mechanism to remove nitrogen, what would be happening to the system? So is that one, Robert? All right. So Nancy, your question is, if we didn't have this habitat complexity that contributes to the capacity to, de to denitrify, what would be the consequence? It would be the cartoon, the eutrophic cartoon, where you'd have big algal blooms that are more than the system can assimilate, that senesce and end up in the sediments and create anoxic conditions and fish die, and then the habitat, the bottom habitat is degraded. So it's, and that, their feedback. Change to the feedback. Right. Right. Exactly. And that has, people talk about top down and bottom up. And so the bottom up is the nutrients supplying the plants that the animals eat. And then top down is things that eat animals, either eating more or less of them. And so you have the controls on both sides of the system. And so denitrification is, is a bottom up thing. So that's looking at the nutrient supply. So we generally look at the first thing it affects, which are the primary producers. But you're right, absolutely. I mean, habitat loss comes both ways. Priscilla? I, th I think that they're doing an increasingly, oh, sorry, John. The question is, do I know anything about the North Carolina oyster shell recycling program, and do I think we're doing a good job? And the answer is, I think so, yeah, that they're, they're, it's a big emphasis, and being next door to Division of Marine Fisheries in Moorhead City, I can tell you that they have barrels and barrels and barrels of oyster shell, and I know that they've been very, very um, thoughtful and effective in using that shell for our restoration and using it also, probably most importantly, as a public awareness thing. So we don't recreate the mining curve and that so that, and so that people have an awareness of the need to, to replenish the resource if they want to have it as something that they can get wild caught oysters. Um, I don't think we, the question is, um, ha, what have we found at Cape Hatteras? And I actually, I've um, worked some with John, but that's primarily been John's work. And we haven't, done a, we haven't done any of the nitrogen cycling work. And John and I haven't really formally looked through it. But uh, that's certainly something that we have, have on tap, because that's, Right, right. So, and I think that's, that's a, a pretty re a reasonable conclusion everywhere is that the best substrate for oyster restoration is oyster shell. Um, people have found problems with marl, reduced settlement, but also it increases the amount of boring sponge, and that's a big oyster nuisance predator. Jimmy. Yeah. Going back to the question about the oyster shell recycling program, it's my understanding that that program has been defunded with this current budget and the um, coordinator position has been eliminated and there is some talk about trying to privatize um, that program. Interesting. So Jimmy's comment was that he, in the current budget, the oyster shell recycling has been defunded and the coordinator's position eliminated and that there were, er, is some interest in trying to privatize it, which I would have a hard time understanding. But that's unfortunate because it was a really effective thing. Priscilla, I'm changing my answer. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys so much again. I appreciate everyone finding their way out here on a summer night. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm.